banded together from remote galaxies, are 13 of the most sinister villains of all time, the Legion of Doom. Dedicated to a single objective, the conquest of the universe. Only one group dares to challenge this intergalactic threat. This is episode four of Mutant Monday, where I'm going to focus on none other than the original X-Men himself, the extra man himself, Professor Charles Xavier, okay? By no means am I an expert. I've done my homework a little bit. I'm a fanboy first, but I'm going to kick a little bit of knowledge to you just so you know, okay? Charles Xavier, Professor X, first appeared in um, X-Men number one, which came out in September in 1963. Uh, Charles Xavier is one of the strongest, most powerful mutants out there, Okay. His parents were both nuclear physicists, scientists. Charles' power started to manifest at a young age, but while Charles was growing up at a very young age, his biological father died. His mother married a very abusive um, person, and his name uh, was the last name of Marco. So Marco, as we know, is Kane Marco, was, became Charles' stepbrother, who eventually becomes the juggernaut, all right? So, yes... Charles Xavier, the Juggernaut, K. Marco, our stepbrothers, all right? And their battle goes on for many, many issues throughout the X-Men mythos, throughout the X-Men universe, and it's just a really um, great storyline, story arc. Some of my favorite stories come from that, um, as you can see through previous issues. So, Charles and Kane um, were together, and Charles actually witnessed... Um, Kane become the juggernaut with the um, the ruby of uh, Saratok. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Sait Satorak. My God, I can't say it right. But actually, that's how um, the juggernaut became juggernaut. So juggernaut is not a mutant. Um, he was magically enhanced. Okay. So Charles Xavier, uh, his mutant ability started to manifest at a very young age, and he started to get a grasp on it, but. As a result of his manifestation of his mutant ability, he lost his hair, so he was bald at a very young age. Myself, I'm bald by choice. Well, maybe not by choice. Half by choice, half by not. So, um, in the books, Charles always told people that he had alopecia, alopecia, which is, um, this is something that affects men with baldness and stuff like that. So, Charles graduated high school very young, graduated college very young, and wanted to see the world, so he became kind of like a drifter. And during his drifting, he went, he met a young man by the name of Eric Magnus Lencher. Okay, now Magneto. Okay, Magneto first appeared in X Men number four. Oh, actually, X Men number one. I apologize, uh, but I like this book because this is the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, which I've talked about before, um, stuff like that. So, just a cool X Men book. I'll try to get rid of the glare right there. Yeah. So. Um, this is the yin and the yang of comic books, movies, and stuff like this. I of, often always reference the fact that good stories, good comic book stories, um, need strong villains. And you don't get a much stronger villain than Magneto. And you don't get much more of a powerful mutant than Charles Xavier. So you have two people who believe in the complete opposite. Charles believes in the good of all mankind. Magneto says, no, no, no. We are above them because of all of the things that Magneto has encountered through his life, through World War II, through the Nazi regime, which I'm going to talk about, foreshadowing, in maybe episode five of Mutant Monday on the Lords of the Long Box channel. So these guys have the relationship of, we need to save the world? No, no, the world is for us. So this goes back and forth, and there's so many different stories um, that encompass the X-Men mythos, where everything is about the belief that there are good in humans, there is no good in humans, and why should there be good in humans? We are better than them. Um, so that really is, um, I don't know how to say this, that really is the best, you know, hero, villain storyline, because they're good friends. They are good friends in the comic books, in the movies. They play chess together. They have, you know... Um, they have dialogue about what they believe is right. They've teamed up a few times. And I'll never forget in X-Men number one when they were in court and Jean Grey was talking about, you know, the X-Gene and stuff like that. And uh, Magneto, or which was he was Eric at the time, looks at Charles and goes, Charles, we are the future, not them. 
really. And that's the evolution of the human gene that human superiors will eventually take over. All right. So Professor X needs to find more mutants. He needs to identify mutants because if he knows if he's one, there's one out there. So he creates this band of X-Men, which we know as Jean Grey, Cyclops, um, Scott Summers, Warren Worthington, Hank McCoy, and Bobby Drake. So, but he actually encounters, before I've already told my resources, he actually encounters Jean Grey first at a very, very young age. Because supposedly Jean's fa uh, Jean Grey's father was a co-worker of Professor X when he was kind of hiding in the shadows and stuff like that. And actually he identifies Jean Grey as a mutant at the age of 11, which is a lot earlier, uh, 10 or 11, which is a little bit earlier than the mutant gene starts to manifest. Usually it starts to go through puberty um, and stuff like that. But... He uses Cerebro. Now, I always thought Cerebro was a semi-organic kind of machine, but it, it has, it's, it's become its own character. And the first appearance of Cerebro, um, for all of you guys keeping score at home, is X-Men number seven, all right? So this is where they first identify Cerebro. Um, if you're looking for a hashtag for First Appearance Friday, something I've been on Instagram for many years now, and I've never seen. But first appearance of Cerebro, X-Men number six, iconic cover, uh, with the blob, Freddie Dukes, and uh, the X-Men. Great cover. Steve, um, Jack Kirby, and Stan Lee. All right. So, in X-Men number nine, for those of you guys keeping it home, score at home also, is the first appearance. Uh, this really is the first appearance of his um, backstory, where you find out a little bit about Charles Xavier, about him growing up, and stuff like this. He's traveling. He meets Lucifer. Um, this is, I think, when the jewel of uh, Saratok is found with Kane and stuff like that. So you have the backstory there. Also, it's the first time the Avengers cross over into the X-Men. More importantly, great Kirby cover with the original Avengers, the original X-Men, Professor Xavier. Lots of great stuff happening in this book. All right. Then we move on to... So the X-Men go on. They have many, many challenges, many, many um, fights with different characters and stuff like that. And they're just trying to kind of feel their way through the world. Uh, and, you know, this book came out in the 60s. Very um, turbulent times for civil unrest. So great for Stan Lee for putting this on paper in a way that, hey, you know what? As a kid back then, I kind of know what's going on in the world. It's not so nice, but give me another spinoff about uh, racial injustice and stuff like that. And really neat because Charles Xavier was, um, was kind of designed to look like Yul Brenner which obviously makes sense and stuff like that. And Patrick Stewart is the um, epitome of what Charles Xavier should look like, what he should act like. So great casting, whoever did that back in the day. And then, you know, the X-Men get a little bit older. So then they create GS giant Size X-Men number one and X-Men 94, where we have a new storyline and we have the um, all new, all different, you know, not uncanny at this point. Uh, but pretty neat. And, you know, Charles is going through, he's finding new character. He's finding Banshee. He's finding Sunfire. Uh, he's also keeping a close eye on Jean Grey at a young age, which was unbeknownst to her. Uh, and this actually happens in the comic books. Uh, Professor X puts some blocks, some mental blocks on Jean Grey because he knows how powerful she can get. And more importantly, we know how that all turns out uh, with Dark Phoenix and stuff like that. So, great storylines. Um, Professor Xavier, because I don't think he's a very flashy character, gets a lot of the appreciation that he should. But without him, we have no X-Men. And without him, I don't really have a fun comic book to read, although there were many of them and stuff like that. So, that's a little bit of a backstory of Professor Xavier. He is very, very powerful. Um, he's been part of many, many groups. Uh, New Mutants, he's part of the Illuminati, Black Bolt, Doctor Strange... Um, Reed Richards, he was part of the group that had to ship Hulk off the planet, which eventually ensues into Planet Hulk and World War Hulk. And he's a very, very powerful mutant. At one point, they said his mutant ability could go through the entire planet. He does have an offensive ability, which are like psionic mind blasts, which to me would just be like, you know, um, migraines times 50. He's able to manipulate people's minds and stuff like that. He creates a school, the School for Gifted Youngsters, um, which I do think that he does some of his powers to keep really it off the grid and to make it unseemingly just like a private school for gifted um, youth. And that storyline goes on for many, many years. So uh, I've been talking for almost 10 minutes now, and that's my backstory of Professor X.